Today, we're going to be looking at the outcomes of linguistic fieldwork, and specifically, exploring outcomes of linguistic fieldwork that help us to further the endeavor of providing a description of how a language is spoken. So ten years after the publication of Gippert, Himmelman, and Mosel's 2008 Essentials of Language documentation, many of their criticisms of traditional descriptive endeavors remain. This talk will focus on the two they bring up which are most closely related to what has been referred to as the Boasian Trilogy, specifically provided with a grammar and a dictionary, it is still impossible to know how the language is spoken, that is, Many communicative practices found in a given speech community remain undocumented and unreconstructable. Second, that grammars and dictionaries provide little that is of direct use to non-linguists. Uh, and to these observations, I would like to add a third, that relying on collections of texts, it is still difficult to gain clear insights into questions of linguistic style or indigenous history, culture, or wider perspectives, what Boas himself referred to as fundamental ethnic ideas. It should be mentioned that this talk was inspired largely by a keynote address given by Felix Emeka at a language documentation training course organized by the Endangered Languages Documentation Project in late August in Rabat, Morocco. As such, the central motivation of this talk owes a great deal to that of Felix's. This talk is different, however, in that um, the focus on, is on documentary outcomes rather than documentary methods. Also, uh, this talk seeks to explore some concrete examples, or at least promising precursors to the outcomes listed, uh, as well as examine the state of the art in using texts to their full potential. The entire talk is available at the link uh, shown on the screen. So before we go any further, I think that it's important to situate myself within the larger enterprise about which I'll be talking. So on the disciplinary totem pole, I'm what they call an early career researcher. I began serious documentary fieldwork on a South Cushitic language spoken in Tanzania called Gorwa in 2012. Since finishing my PhD at uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies earlier this year, I've begun some basic documentation of a Bantu language called Isanzu, located in the same linguistic area as uh, the Gorwa language, uh, approximately 200 kilometers due west. Next year, I begin a two-year postdoctoral fellowship with uh, the Endangered Languages Documentation Project uh, to conduct further fieldwork on both Gorwa and Isanzu, as well as a third language in the same area, Hadza, uh, a language isolate spoken near Lake Iasi. In terms of uh, Boasian outputs, I must admit that my personal experience is currently limited to an audiovisual corpus of Gorwa language materials, again hosted at the Endangered Languages Archive, begun in 2017 and with materials added as they are collected. Uh, a second output, I suppose, is a, a Gorwa grammar sketch of around 100 pages or so, uh, available in my doctoral dissertation. Uh, with that said, a lot of my academic attention is given to questions of documentation and description, and I do feel like I hopefully have something to say today which is new or interesting to you. So let us begin, as they say at the beginning, with Franz Ori Boas, who actually began his career as a physicist, trained in Germany roughly a generation before Einstein. His doctoral work was about the optical properties of water, a subject which made him fascinated by the problems of perception, and how perception can, in turn, influence quantitative measurements. This fascination persisted as Boas turned his attention to the study of people, developing the theory of cultural relativism that the beliefs, behaviors, and ideals of a person cannot be understood in some absolute sense, but must be judged based on that person's culture. In its pursuit of observable data, an insistence upon long periods of residence with the people under study, uh, usually living and working with them, as one learns, and perhaps most relevant to linguists, the assertion that understanding the language was vital to understanding the people and the larger culture in which they were situated. As a result, this approach 
saw linguistic outcomes as vital academic outputs in the work of describing a people and a culture. These outcomes became embedded in the triad of the grammar, the dictionary, and the book of texts. The works of Boas's student, Edward Saper, offer a good example of the Boasian trilogy. Other students of Boas's were not so keen on linguistics. Margaret Mead, uh, for example, couldn't be bothered with any of them. Nevertheless, these three outputs are considered a sine qua non of any modern documentary pursuit. Visualized, we see the trilogy as points on a triangle, each work set in relation to each other, with texts given the pride of place at the apex, as Boas saw all other work developing from the linguistic material collected in the texts. A concrete example of the trilogy that I'm familiar with is that of Iraq, substantial formal grammar written by Martin Maus in 1993, followed by a formal compilation of Iraq texts featuring transcriptions of stories, historical accounts, songs, proverbs, and riddles, and an Iraq English dictionary by Martin Maus, Roland Kiesling, and Iraq speaker Martha Koro. Sometimes, the trilogy is condensed into one publication, such as this grammar, texts, and lexicon of Alagua, produced by Martin Mouse. Of course, neat diagrams like this, however, betray the fact that the model has things missing. Ameka makes what every linguist knows explicit when he states that a problem with the descriptive trilogy is that gaps and holes tend to occur. They do not capture specific ways of expressing oneself idiomatically in a given variety. And by this, what he means is we're talking about things like formulaic language, those expressions which are fixed uh, in form and often non-literal in meaning, such as idioms, proverbs, and other speech formulae. Conversational routines, the conventions of speech regularized by a community for a given situation. For example, who speaks first? How long are greetings? Can you interrupt? And if you can interrupt, how? Special speech genres. Um, how does the language in a grammar compare to the same language when used to communicate via text message? Or how about the grammar of a, a person talking to their pet dog? Uh, and also multimodal aspects of speech. I'm talking about things like gesture, distance between speakers, and the physical context of a speech situation. So this is a recording from when one of my chief consultants traveled up into the hills to visit a family of other consultants. It was the first time she had met them, and this is the conversation that ensued. Essentially, other than a comment on one of the speaker's swollen jaw from a toothache, and doting on me a bit, uh, the entire conversation is the speakers saying hello to each other. The salutation is saita, how are you? To which the response is always sayu, fine. Even the man with the to toothache replies, I'm fine. The only bit of information that is exchanged comes towards the end, when it is revealed that the hosts are related to a neighbor of the visitor. This isn't introduced directly, however. One of the hosts asks about the health of the neighbor, using the same how are you formula as the greetings. This gives the speakers an opportunity to move from greetings to substantially discussing and uh, exchanging information. 
This is a second example, a recording made of a diviner reading a client's prospects in stones, known as tlae. What is interesting here is that the diviner enters into a conversation with the stones, asking them questions and revealing answers according to their various configurations. There are several interesting aspects here. If the recording shown were a bit longer, several lexical items unknown in Gorwa otherwise would occur here in the stone dialogue. And at 26 seconds, one can hear a soft, ejective sound, a sound produced only by traditional healers and diviners, and only in their respective contexts of healing and divining. Perhaps most obvious, though, is the interplay of movement and speech. Questions are asked and answered only when accompanied by the proper manipulation of the stones. Both of these examples, then, leave us with the question, Whither in the Boazian trilogy does material like this make its home? Certainly, some aspects could be accommodated by careful transcription in the texts, and perhaps the greeting formulae could be accommodated somewhere in the grammar or the dictionary. But there's undoubtedly the intuition that in none of these outputs can the nuance of each of these examples be expressed fully. But each of our uh, examples here are clearly uh, cases of language. Indeed, I can't imagine many linguists discounting them as somehow extraneous. Therefore, if not here, then where can these aspects of language be fully addressed? Part of the answer lies in an expanded set of Boazian documentary outcomes. Here we see the traditional Boazian trilogy preserved with the position of texts still central to the enterprise, but now we see an expanded set of outcomes, each of which contributes to the task of documenting and describing the language and communicative practices of a speech community. Each of these new outcomes will be explained and exemplified in no particular order. We'll start with the grammar of usage. So most grammars are oriented from a form to function perspective. We open the book, we turn to the section titled Pronouns, read the subsection on number marking, and only here might we get an indication of what communicative function number marking may have. For example, outside of its obligatory role as agreement, plural number forms may be associated with respect, for example in French and some Bantu languages. A grammar of usage inverts this structure, beginning with communicative functions, and moving to forms. As such, in this kind of grammar, one turns to a section on how to indicate two things happening at once, reads the subsection on co-commitment tense marking, and then gets an explanation on how verbs inflect and the form of the appropriate morpheme or morphemes. A celebrated example of this kind of grammar is Leach and Svartvik's A Communicative Grammar of English, a peek at the table of contents on our left gives us some ideas of the categories that might be developed. How does one express disagreement? How does one take part in friendly communication? And further, though not primarily arranged in the function to form grammar, grammars in the Mouton Grammar Library series have useful subject indexes, often with communicative functions included. Examination of the two grammars in this series, uh, examination of two grammars in this series reveal a host of useful categories, including curses and recapitulation, specifically in narratives. Cristofaro warns against mixing formal and functional categories in a single subject index, and instead suggests a special index for each. This, of course, is uh, in a grammar that is primarily form to function. Um, this presentation goes a bit farther, 
putting forward standalone volumes such as the section of Leech and Svartvik offered above. Obviously, as the peculiarities of language emerge, so too will sections in a grammar like this need to be made uh, to order. Greetings and divining would need to be sections in Gorwa, for example. Moving on, essentially every thesaurus is actually an ethno-thesaurus, except the thesauruses which group and divide words into wider concepts and shade of shades of meaning according to a Western cultural paradigm, are just called thesauruses. We see a classic example in the Rajat's thesaurus, which is structured according to an increasingly fine level of conceptual categories, in this case reflecting late Enlightenment European culture. The ethno-thesauruses that I would like to propose in this talk should be similar in that they be organized according to the conceptual categories, but different in that these conceptual categories would reflect the groupings and divisions of the culture of the language being documented and described. In Gorwa, for example, the ostrich would probably be grouped as an animal, not as a bird, and most reptiles and amphibians would be considered classes of insects. Meanwhile, cows, calabashes, and types of song would all be subject to a strict subdivision according to criteria that I currently do not fully understand. Fleck, in addressing the task of identifying animal names in languages, reminds us that the systems will rarely, if ever, be symmetrical with our Western scientific paradigms. I provide two song recordings as a case in point. and perhaps even informed listener, these two songs are similar. Call and response, sung to clapped hands, etc. But to the singers of these songs, and indeed most Gorwa people, they are quite different. Tondor Doya is what is called a Manda song, and Konkir Hando is a Halo song. Manda songs are typically sung by members of the secret Manda Brotherhood at meetings in the sacred groves Scattered all around Gorwa land, halo songs are used to coordinate groups of youth as they conduct communal farming. It is the function of these songs that differentiate them, a taxonomy accessible only to singers of these songs and speakers of this language. Accounts of paralinguistic repertoires are altogether more rare, and I can't say I've yet encountered a work that covers the paralinguistics of a language community in any systematic way. Essentially, such an account would address things like body language and posture, distance and body contact between speakers, pitch and rate of speech, concepts essential to speech and regulated by it, but not strictly 
part of language. Ethnographies of communication sit directly on the border between anthropology and linguistics, and again, can form an essential part of our understanding of language as a system. Muriel Seville Troik, well known in this field, defines ethnography of communication as a pursuit that focuses on the patterning of communicative behavior as it constitutes one of the systems of culture, as it functions within the holistic context of culture, and as it relates to patterns in other component systems. Some examples include Albert, 1972, who relates situation-specific rules for speaking to Burundi social values and social structure. Blom and Gumper's 1972 treats code switching in Norway from the perspective of the interrelationship of social constraints, cultural values, and language rules. And Mitchell, 2018, examines how the use of Datoga Women's Father-in-Law Avoidance Register helps speakers construct social relations. The methodology involved in ethnography of communication is most likely present in even the most formally oriented linguist, and involves paying attention to and exploring the following aspects, abbreviated famously by Del Himes uh, as speaking. So we look at genre, which is a type of event, the topic, the referential focus of the speech event, the purpose, both that of the community and the expectation for the communicative outcomes, as well as the individual participants' goals, the setting, including the location, time of day, season, weather, uh, participants, their age, sex, social status, and other relevant categories, such as whether they're diviners, healers, message form, including both vocal and non-vocal cha uh, channels, which language they're using in a code switching event, for example. Act sequencing, the ordering of events, including turn taking and overlap, prescriptions for interaction, what people in the community deem as ways that people should act during a given event, or ways that they should not act during a given event. Norms of interpretation, so the common knowledge in the society which allow particular inferences to be drawn about what is to be taken literally, what is to be construed as a metaphor, etc. I return to Mitchell 2018 as an example with which I am most familiar, the Datoga people, speakers of a Nilotic language and whose communities border on those of the peoples with whom I work, the Gorwa, uh, the Isanzu, and the Hadza, are patrilocal, that is, a newlywed couple will go to live at or nearby the husband's father's household. This results in young women coming in contact with male in-laws who, in Datoga culture, demand a great deal of respect and deference. In fact, Datoga women have developed a register by which they avoid the use of their father-in-law's name and all homophones or near homophones of it, resulting in an extensive system of alternate special father-in-law avoidance terms. This is at once a fascinating linguistic phenomenon, as it operates according to its uh, own system of rules, but also a cultural phenomenon, reflecting beliefs, values, and organization of society. In short, a classic example of uh, ethnography of communication and the richness that it leads, uh, that it gives a description of a language. Returning to the expanded diagram, it is now worth reflecting on the concept of texts. In an important way, texts in this expanded vision have not changed. They remain at the heart of the documentation, a principle we inherit directly from Boas. However, now both the advancement of technology as well as the exigencies of data transparency have resulted in the need for an amendment of what the text is and should be. Typically, the call now is for texts not to be seen as printed collections of tales, but to be snapshots of natural language in use, curated, transcribed, translated, time-aligned, and linguistically glossed and annotated, of course. Data must also, where agreed to by the language community, be openly accessible for others to see and use. Crucially, every example should be cited, allowing readers of any linguistic output to return to the recording, that is the text, and to consult the source material. 
An example of this vision for texts occurs throughout the work of Dr. Lauren Gaughan, who begins all of her works, and even short presentations like this one, with an explicit description of the corpus of texts upon which she draws, its size, the genres contained, and how much has been analyzed, and crucially, where and how it can be accessed. All examples are used subsequently throughout the work are cited with a reference by which users can visit the corpus and find the exact material being used as evidence. So this uh, is represented by the numerical code in the lower right-hand corner. Texts are therefore inherently at the heart of these documentary outcomes. At once, the source material and the unifying feature of a set of materials with differing descriptive purviews. To conclude then, what does this mean for the collection of linguistic material? Three important tenets to remember from our talk is that language is multimodal, language is versatile and adaptable, and language is part of the larger community's history, culture, and beliefs. As such, because language is multimodal, Documentation must be audiovisual, taking in as much of the wider context as possible. Because language is versatile and adaptable, documentation must be broad, including as many voices and linguistic practices as possible. Because language is part of the larger community's history, culture, and beliefs, documentation must be shaped by the wishes and needs of the community such that what is important to them forms an integral part of the record. Thank you, and these are my references.